In this video, Derek Lin, author of Tao Te Ching, Annotated and Explained, discusses the Taoist concept of Wu Wei, what we often translate as action without attachment. The discussion is specifically regarding mindfulness, the concept of change, and the concept of nonviolence. Here's Derek. So there were three questions that came up last time. And let me start with the first question. And the question was, um, OK, Wu Wei sounds really good. But what can I do if I still haven't found Wu Wei in my own life as of yet? So it's great to talk about the theory of acting without attachments, of uh, how everything can be smooth and easy, and you can achieve much more powerful results with uh, seemingly no effort at all. Uh, but what if you haven't found that magical spark that allows you to act in the way of Wu Wei? What would be a practical way to get going? So what I always tell people is that in order to discover the essence of Wu Wei for yourself and be able to have it consistently in your life, you have to be mindfully aware. You have to have this habit of knowing where you are, what you are doing, and what you have just done. Now, I make it sound so easy, right? But think about the times when you walk into a room and you forget why you walked into that room. You remember you wanted to do something in that room. You know, your, your body feels like you're anticipating finding something, getting something, doing something, but then your mind is like, well, I have no recollection as to what that is. Then what you have to do, as, uh, as I've had to do quite a few times, is to retrace my steps. I go back to the room where I came from, and then I walk those steps again, hoping that I will jog my memory, trigger that recollection, and then say, oh, okay, I, I, wanted to, I came in here to get my glasses or something. That's an example of how most people are. So if you think about it, from the perspective of greater awareness, the sages, the people who have mastered this teaching, will look upon you and say that, well, you still have quite a bit of work to, to have that greater awareness at all times. You have yet to make it a habit. Uh, so, you are not quite there yet. And if you don't live life in a mindful way, you will not remember to practice doing all of your actions from the Wu Wei perspective. So, mindful awareness is really first and foremost. So, in connection with mindful awareness, let me relate a famous story from the Zen tradition uh, to everyone to illustrate my point. So once upon a time, in ancient China, there was a Zen practitioner who felt that he was making pretty good progress on the path of spirituality. He felt like he was understanding Zen teachings quite well. So his feeling was further justified when he was promoted to the role of a Zen teacher. So everywhere he went, people asked him questions, He's able to share what he understood about the Zen to them. He felt pretty good about himself. He felt like he was pretty much accomplished. So one day, he visited with a Zen master. It was raining that day, so he took umbrella with him. And when he arrived at the dwelling of the Zen master, as per custom, uh, throughout Asia, he took off his shoes, he set aside his umbrella. So those of you who have Asian friends, you may have already come across this custom. Here in the West, oftentimes, people just you know, walk right through the door into a house. To Asians, to most people from Asian cultures, whether it's Japanese, Korean, or Chinese, or whatever, that's a bad idea because you're tracking dirt into the house. And you know, someone in that household has been spending a lot of time keeping everything clean. So the least you can do is the courtesy of taking off your shoes so that you don't track dirt into it. 
So it was the case in ancient times as well. So that's what he did. Took off his shoes, set aside his umbrella, and then he went in to visit with the Zen master. So he's having a discussion with the Zen master. He's describing everything that he has learned. You know, he's expressing that he feels pretty satisfied with his own progress on the path of Zen, of Zen teachings. Then the Zen master asked him, so when you came in just now, when you came in from the rain, you set down your umbrella and you took off your shoes. Do you recall if you put your shoes down to the left side of the umbrellas or to the right side? So the Zen teacher stopped dead in his tracks. He's thinking, hmm, uh, well, I just went through the motions. I have zero recollection of what I did. When I was going through the motions, I was not living mindfully at all. I was acting more like a robot. Of course, in ancient China, they didn't have robots, so he was thinking more like, you know, I was act acting just uh, in this automated fashion, you know, without the engagement of my mind. And in the Zen teachings, it is so important for us to live in every moment of life, to live fully, because this is the only life we have. Every moment in it is precious. If you recognize that, you will be fully present in every moment. So in that instant, he came to the realization that even though he had been studying the Zen for 10 years and had been promoted to the role of a Zen teacher, he was actually still just a beginner. So right there and then, he asked the Zen master to accept him as a disciple to study for another 10 years. So that is the Zen story often cited to describe, to illustrate the importance of mindful awareness. Let me put that as a challenge to you as well. Are you always aware of what you have just done? Or are you just going through the motions, kind of like sleepwalking through life? Most people are sleepwalking through life most of the time. Most people are on automatic pilot. As soon as they have done something, they forget what they have done. So this one, uh, upon hearing this story, this one lady says, yeah, you know, I work, I work at this place, this cafe. People come in and they order stuff. So during lunchtime, people come in and order their sandwiches. So I decided to see how mindful people are. Soon as they're done getting their sandwich, they have paid for it, I'll ask them. So you've just ordered something. Do you recall what you just ordered? Because in that cafe, they have, you know, ham and cheese sandwich, they have sal egg salad sandwich, they have hamburgers, they have all kinds of different sandwiches. So she asked, what kind of sandwich did you just order? She discovered that nine times out of ten, people don't know what they have just ordered. They have to look down, look at the wrapper, and say, oh, um, I just got a, uh, oh, oh, it's a bologna sandwich. Huh. So that just goes to show. And if you want to see this for yourself, it's very easy. When you see that someone has just checked his watch, his or her watch, for the time, okay, go up and ask, hey, what time is it? I will bet nine times out of ten they need to check again. But they just checked, right? It's so weird. It's so strange. Don't you know? You checked only a few seconds ago. So why do you have to check again when I ask you? It's because they were on automatic pilot. So the challenge is for all of us to take ourselves off of automatic pilot, to live life mindfully, to be completely in charge, to be aware of what's going on at every moment. So what are some practical ways of doing that? If you take a look at the slide, you'll see my suggestion. I suggest, and this is a plug for one of my books, take a look at the Tao of Joy every day. And I recommend it most often because it is so simple to get into. It's just one page per day. Every page has a section called 
the Tao today, which I would like to suggest that you can use as your meditative thoughts or personal challenge for the day. And then I have an example there. Day 208. Uh, so what I did was that when I was contemplating my answer to this question, I just picked up the book and I just, you know, opened it up randomly to take a look to see what kind of uh, daily challenge or daily thought can I come up with. And I thought 208 was a pretty good example of what we're talking about here. So let me, let me go ahead, and, because it is so short, I'll go ahead and just uh, I'll read it to you quickly so you see what I mean. I know not everybody has this book. So right in the middle of the book, the book has 365 pages. So day 208 is um, just a little past the midpoint of the book. Day 208 is called Undivided Attention. And it goes like this. An increasingly common sight in the modern world is people being distracted while communicating with others. For instance, a teenager may be texting while carrying on an in-person conversation. A coworker may be talking to you while keeping an eye on the computer monitor. Chances are they do not understand the negative impact that this has on others. It is impolite at best and it undermines whatever positive impression may have been created. Dao cultivators, on the other hand, demonstrate respect for others by giving them undivided attention when conversing with them. Paying only partial attention sends the signal that the communication is unimportant. Instead, you want to send the signal that you honor every exchange. You always do this regardless of what others do because you know you are responsible for your communication. So that's day 208. Let me say you are responsible for only your communication. You cannot be responsible for anyone else's. Therefore, it is especially important for you to take charge of that responsibility and execute your own path in life with impeccable perfection as much as possible. So what about the challenge for the day? What is the doubt today for 208? It says, challenge yourself to be fully present when interacting with other people today. Remember that sincere, heartfelt communication from one soul to another is sacred. Keep this in mind when you communicate, even when the other party has no understanding or appreciation of this principle. The Tao shines all the more brightly when its application in the real world is not so easy. So, the commonplace is not precious. The rare few, the exceptions, the exceptional individuals, those are the ones worthy of attention. Those are the ones worthy of your aspiration to become. So my answer to the question, how do I find a way in my own life? I would say start by building your foundation in mindful awareness. So that's my answer. And then I have a practical suggestion. Uh, as to exactly what to do every day. So for those of you who already have the book, I would love to hear from you, uh, see how you've been doing, see if it has made a change in the way you approach life. So let me know. Next question. Question number two. How can anything last if everything is constantly changing all the time. So this is from chapter 55. Chapter 55 says, everything that is in accordance with the Tao lasts. Those that are not in accordance with the Tao or those that go against it are the ones that soon perish. So the ideal for Tao cultivators is to be lasting. 
then the question becomes, well, how can it be? How can you last if everything is constantly changing? Great question. So my answer, as you can see, is that when we talk about being lasting, this is a point that requires clarification. To be lasting does not imply a stagnant, unchanging state. It does not imply a lack of flexibility that you are sort of like a free stream that nothing ever changes from that point on, therefore you are lasting. That's the conventional notion of lasting. The Tao notion of lasting is a dynamic way that goes on and on. So there's no requirement to be, to be static and unchanging. It's actually the opposite way. And what I mean by that is that in order to last in this world, in this ever-changing world, that's a very true observation, the world is ever-changing, ever in order to last, you have to be perceptive of what's going on all around you, and you have to make adjustments. You have to make constant adjustments to respond to the changing conditions. This is just like saying that if you were surfing, even if you don't know how to surf, and I don't, I can tell you that the principle involved in surfing, not so different from bicycle, skateboarding, roller skates, etc., is that you have to be constantly aware of what's going on with the environment, with your body, with the tool that you're using, whether that's a surfboard or skateboard or bicycle. And you have to make adjustments. That's how you stay up. That's how you avoid crashing. That's how you avoid wiping out. If you don't do that, then you are not acting in accordance with the Tao, and pretty soon, you know, big wave comes around, you are, you are wiped out. So, changing yourself, responding to change, is actually the key to last. So, example that I have is not about surfing or skateboarding or anything like that, it's about business world. So if you think about a thriving business that has competed very effectively against all of its competitors. So the competitors go out of business. They don't last. They don't last because they, are, they were not acting in accordance with the Tao. So what I wrote here is that perhaps they use gimmicks. Perhaps they use sales tricks. Perhaps they try to maximize short-term gain at the expense of long-term long-term profitability or long-term survival or better yet, long-term prosperity. So if it acts in accordance with the Tao, for instance, if it puts service first, if it responds to the changing demands of its customers, then it's going to last. So this business is a good example. It lasts not because it is static and unchanging and does its business the same way all the time. It's lasting because it is able to respond to market demands. It's got the doubt. So I hope that clarification helps. So let's move on to the next question. Third question. Wu Wei. Unattached action, how does Roy relate to the concept of nonviolence? So let's think about this one. And this is a practical example of how to apply the Tao in daily life. Because sometimes we do come we do find ourselves involved in a complex situation. So there are, broadly speaking, there are three steps involved. And step one, as you can see here, is to first let's get clear on all the different attachments that can come up. When we're talking about violence, example, when someone wants to intimidate or dominate, this is, so I'm describing a bully here, someone who pushes you around, right? That is associated with violence, certainly, because the idea is that, hey, you know, I'm going to beat you up, that type of thing. Number two, when someone wants to exact revenge, so vengeance, much violence involved. 
So that is an attachment as well. Then there's something that on the surface we can all agree with, you know, destroy evil, vanquish evil. Right? Who can disagree with that? Well, I'm about to give you a different perspective. I will say that that's actually an attachment as well. And I'll explain why. Then, number four, dispense punishment. You know, I don't, you're not necessarily evil. I'm not trying to exact vengeance on you for something that you did, but you need to be punished. Okay? So this is a little bit different than the other ones. And I'll, I'll use an extreme example here. I'll use capital punishment. You know, what, what, can be, what can be more punishing than to take away someone's life? Okay? So, in sequence, one, two, three, four, these are the attachments that are increasingly more difficult to let go of. If we think about them, if we gain clarity on them, it'll help us figure out how to be free of attachments when we act. And when you act without attachments, you are in the realm of Wu Wei, and you are also uh, at the level where you can, where you can uh, connect Wu Wei with the concept of nonviolence. So let's examine one, two, three, and four and see how these attachments influence our lives and the negative consequences that can occur. That's step number two. Consider the negative consequences of the various attachments. So let's talk about intimidation. Let's, let's talk about attempts to dominate other people, to be a bully. So what could go wrong? What could be the problem for bullies? Now, as you can see here, I say that to be a bully is to set the karmic mechanism into motion and set oneself up for humiliation. So the moment someone becomes a bully, that plants the seed of humiliation that will manifest at a later time. That is a negative consequence for the bull. So, you know, here I write when Goliath is defeated by David. So that's a story from the Bible, of course. We all know about David versus Goliath. But for a more modern example, I would refer to, to you um, Biff and Marty McFly. Right, which you can see in my slide here. So Biff is the bully. So he's Goliath. He's big and strong, powerful, and he can pummel you, he can punch you, etc. He can intimidate, push you around. Marty McFly represents David. So think about what happens when Biff is defeated by Marty McFly. When Biff gets what's coming to him, think about the elation. Think about the laughs going around in the theater, you know, with the audience. Everybody's happy to see that. For the bully, it's not a great moment. It's a moment of humiliation. So that can happen. But even if there isn't a David to come around with a slingshot to take down Goliath, it could still happen in a different way such as all the weaker people that are being they may decide to band together to resist. They may be in defiance. You know, you can't push us around anymore. You push any one of us around, you push all of us. And we're going to push back. Okay? Now, I want to give you the uh, note that in reality, those who do not follow the Tao it is actually um, unusual for this to happen. You only have to look at the playground, or you know, elementary school, kindergarten, elementary school, high school, bullying situations. It's relatively rare for people for the bully to band together to resist the bullies. Usually, people are bystanders; they, they're spectators. Oh, don't get involved. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna watch him get. I'm gonna watch the nerdy kid get beaten up. It'll be fun. Okay, that's, that's unfortunately the dark side of humanity at work. It can also happen that the people who are bullied, when they see someone even weaker, they turn around and be the bully and become the bully. That's because 
they feel so horrible about being bullied, so powerless, so helpless, that when they see a target of bullying that they themselves had the ability to bully, that they quickly, they very quickly assume the other side. I'm going to be on the side of the powerful, the dominating. Okay? Then they also set themselves up for a future humiliation. It's just that most people can't see it. So it isn't necessarily so that if you understand the, the pain, the misery of being bullied, that you will naturally come to the help of someone who's being bullied. For most people, that may not be true. But for Tao cultivators, it's definitely true. So keep that in mind. Then I have a, uh, the last bullet is what I just alluded to. When a bigger bully comes around, the bully gets bullied. So I have this uh, fun little picture here of the fish. You know, the fish, the small fish is eaten by a bigger fish who was in turn eaten by an even bigger fish, etc. So let me share with you what is the ultimate fish. What's the biggest fish of all? You know, what if you say, well, I'm the strongest there is. I'm like the Incredible Hulk. I'm the strongest there is. So I get to bully everybody. I'll be the one to say, uh, no, actually, there is a bigger fish that's going to bully you. Guess what that is? It's time. So there is a saying, time wounds all heals, uh, which is a play on time heals all wounds. The idea is that in time, you get weaker, you get more feeble, you get, you get sick. Okay? You get to a point where you don't really have the physical resources to call upon to bully anyone anymore. And if a 90-pound weakling was to come around and kick sand in your face when you are old and feeble, there is actually nothing you can do about it. You've just been bullied. You've been swallowed up by the biggest fish of all, time. And there are no exceptions. So no matter how big of a bully you are, there is a bigger fish that's waiting for you. There is a humiliation that's coming. So a negative consequence. If you let go of the attachment to bully someone, to dominate, push people around, you can bypass all of that very easily. So this is one of the things, uh, so this is probably the easiest one to, to tackle because uh, most people will readily agree that, oh yeah, we shouldn't bully other people. Oh, I hate bullies. I was bullied when I was little, you know, stuff like that. People will agree with that quite easily. So this one's not a big, big challenge, but the ones that are coming up, I would say they are bigger challenges. Revenge. People want revenge. Revenge seems to be built in to the nature of humanity. So our entertainment, our movies, our television shows are full of revenge. So think about The Count of Monte Cristo, right? That's a revenge tale. And it's been adapted into many different forms. It seems to be always popular. People want revenge. But the reason why it's a bad idea is that it can be a bottomless pit. So here I have a sequence. Uh, so just imagine you're watching this Kung Fu movie, right? So Kung Fu Fighter A kills Kung Fu Fighter B. The brother of B, also a Kung Fu Fighter, kills A in vengeance. So the brother says, vengeance is mine. You kill my brother, now I'll kill you. Then the son of A, sad, having lost his father, learns Kung Fu comes around, kills the brother of B, who killed his father. The disciple of the brother of B gets better at Kung Fu and kills the son of A. The best friend of, oh, okay. If you, of course, if you make me say the whole thing, then I will say the best friend of the son of A learns Kung Fu and kills the, the disciple of the brother of B. And so it goes on and on and on and on and becomes ever more convoluted. You get the idea. So it's a question. When should the cycle end, if not in the here and now? 
like no matter where, where and when you encounter the beginning of the cycle, cycle of vengeance, I would ask you to look further back in time, uh, further forward in time, pardon me, and think about the endless nature, the bottomless pit of vengeance. And say, well, right now is when I can let go. I can let go of it, relinquish this attachment. So this one I would uh, characterize as medium uh, difficulty to let go of. Then we get into the, the attachments associated with violence that are more difficult to let go. So take a look at the next one. The attachment to the mythology of good versus evil it can lead to even more chaos and I call it mythology for a very specific reason because you assume that you're out of good but everybody does the other side assumes that they are on the side of good you assume that because you are good you must vanquish evil the other side says we're the good guys and we have to vanquish evil and you're evil so the battle never ends. This part is like the never-ending cycle of vengeance, the bottomless pit. As long as both sides feel so self-righteous about their cause, about the evil of the other side, there's not going to be an end to this. So ultimately, understanding the other side is much more effective than trying to destroy the other side. So, no matter how strongly you feel about that, this has been proven true time after time throughout human history. So, we human beings are still around. We haven't wiped each other out because, luckily, people figured out once upon a time that peace is always more preferable than endless warfare. Now, it's not easy to let this one go especially in our society, this is because our society is really big on, on good versus evil. It's embedded in the fabric of our culture. So everywhere we turn, we see this being played out. We see we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. We have to get rid of the bad guys. You know, we have to kill them all. So, as challenging as this is, I want to ask everyone to give a serious consideration and bring about the most difficult cases that you can think of about killing evil, and then think about how on the surface everything seems so cut and dry, everything so black and white, so clear, but when you go deeper, things become much more murky. So, negative consequence is that it never ends, just like revenge. Not easy to let it go, but no one said that the study of the Tao was going to be easy. There are parts of it that are extremely difficult to put into actual daily practice. This is one of them. And also the next one. Next one, the last one, is, you know, when I think about evil, there are some extreme examples that I can think of. So, one example is Anders Breivik. He is the Norwegian killer, mass murderer, who, you know, planted this van bomb that took out nine people, and then he went on to kill 68 people, most of them kids helpless kids, he gunned them down. So he did so willfully, he did so proudly, with no remorse. When I see him, I say to myself, wow, if there is a face of evil, surely that is it. So didn't I just talk about the mythology of good and evil? So how would that apply to this? Well, it's actually associated with this because this is all about capital punishment. So pretty much in the vast majority of the countries in the world, this man will be put to death. 
probably very quickly. Now, he's Norwegian. In Norway, there is no death penalty. Maximum sentence is 21 years. And that sentence, pending review, can be, can be extended five years at a time. So that's, that's where Anders ended up. That he's a prisoner serving his sentence. He's kept away from society. He's kept from weapons. He can never kill again. But they are not putting him to death. To many people, that's an outrage. However, the many people who feel that this is outrageous, those people do not include Lao Tzu. So Lao Tzu was certainly opposed to capital punishment, without a doubt. And here I've cited Dao De Jing 74, for those of you who want to review what Lao Tzu thinks about that. Lao Tzu basically says that there is a natural order of things. And if we were to take on the role of this master executioner, which is nature, then we're sort of like an inexperienced carpenter using very sharp tools. It is, uh, it is uh, very likely that we end up hurting ourselves. So when I did the translation of chapter 74, I was completely against what Lao Tzu was saying. But that was 15, 15 plus years ago when I encountered this. Now, as I look at it, I can see the wisdom of Lao Tzu. One of the things that I used to say was that while well, capital punishment, you know, it's a deterrent. It deters crime. But when I look deeper into it, I got to tell you, the countries of the world, most countries of the world that have abolished death sentence have lower crime rates than most countries that have not. So, if you talk about deterrence, evidence is pretty weak. And there are many other layers to the debate on capital punishment. I urge you to look into it. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, but let me say that this is an attachment that can be extremely difficult to relinquish. I place this as the last item because it is so hard for many of us to let go of this uh, imaginary concept of justice. You know, this person has killed, and therefore we need to kill him. We need to, we need to put him down. We need to extinguish his life so he can never do it again. Then the question to ask is, well, if a criminal has taken lives, perhaps many, many lives. Does it mean that we have to follow him or her down to the gutter and take his life too? Do we have to become a monster a little bit in response to a monstrous deed? Does it turn us a little bit like him or her, the monstrous killer? Why? Why is that a necessity? Why can we not let go of it instead? Why can we not use Norway as an aspiration that their system is working a whole lot better than our system? I got to say, measure after measure. So I don't expect to convince everybody. There's probably going to be quite a few people who disagree with me. All I ask right now is that you give us some thought and let go of the attachments connected to violence. So let me cover step three, and then we can take our break. Not easy. Not easy at all. So step three is to consider the Tao-centric, skillful utilization of force. So when I say nonviolence, I'm not talking about pacifism. I'm not necessarily talking about turning the other cheek. I'm not talking about Gandhi. I'm talking about the Tao concept of peace. That peace, just like the yin and yang symbol, it requires an element which is the mastery of the skillful utilization of force, which is why so many 
skillful, deadly, proficient practitioners of martial arts are dedicated cultivators of the Tao. There is no conflict in them between their deadly arts and their philosophy that is pro-life and pro-peace. So think about the use of force in the following context. To prevent the beginning of violence. Dao De Jing chapter 64 says, when something is just at the beginning stage, when it is still small, it can be easily taken care of. Which is to say, a stitch in time saves none. Number two, use force when you need to defend yourself and your loved ones. Okay? I would not be the one to tell you that when someone is intense upon harming you and your loved ones, that you let it happen. Okay? Dao De Jing chapter 67 says, compassion gives rise to true courage. When you are defending yourself and your loved ones, that's a manifestation of true courage, and it is in accordance with the Tao. So, notice that number one and two have nothing to do with utilizing violence as a way to further your ego. Okay? You are working for protection, for peace. It is the same with number three, that if you find yourself trapped, if you are backed into a corner, and you are about to be forced into senseless conflict, you may need the skillful utilization of force to get yourself away from that situation, to put some distance between yourself and the, the conflict that was about to occur. So, in order to withdraw from that senseless conflict, it is entirely correct and in accordance with the Tao to have your own skillful utilization of force. Lastly, to promote peace, to protect the peaceful, protect the harmony, protect civilization, these, once again, are not due to your ego, it's not to dominate others, it's not to gloat, it is because these are the right things to do even when they are not easy to do or inconvenient. They are for the greater good, so this is what it means to act without attachments. They are the opposite of the previous four examples of acting with much attachments. Attachments to different things that are difficult to let go of. This is being free of attachments, therefore, this is connected to Wu Wei, actions without attachments. Let's go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. Qi Okay, everybody, we are done. Participate in the Tao meeting by joining us online. For information, go to Taoism.net forward slash Tao.